Good evening. My name is Danielle Dart and I coordinate public programs for the Minnesota Historical Society. Welcome to tonight's special lecture, Are Women People? A History of the Equal Rights Amendment with Professor Kimberly Hamlin, which we are holding in connection with the Extraordinary Women exhibition currently on display at the Minnesota History Center in St. Paul. In 1923, a group of women who were just coming off the successful ratification of the 19th Amendment launched a new campaign to end the legal distinction between men and women in America. To this end, they proposed a new constitutional amendment stating that, quote, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex, close quote. Since then, the Equal Rights Amendment has sparked an ever-changing parade of debates. Are women people first or mothers first? Are women fundamentally equal to men or fundamentally different from men? What would it look like for women to be both equal and different? And how might gender equality impact society? In 1972, the states failed to ratify the ERA due in part to the successful efforts of a conservative coalition spearheaded by Phyllis Schlafly. And yet in that same year, Alice Paul, one of the people who brought the ERA into be being told an interviewer, I never doubted that equal rights was the right direction. Most reforms, most problems are complicated. But to me, there is nothing complicated about ordinary equality. Since 2016, the Equal Rights Amendment has regained momentum and some are predicting that 2021 may just be the year it becomes law. Here to help us examine this history and consider its relevance for our current moment is Dr. Kimberly Hamlin, Professor of History and Global and Intercultural Studies and an affiliate professor of the Women's Gender and Sexuality Program at Miami University in Ohio a recent recipient of a National Endowment for the Humanities Public Scholar Award. Hamlin regularly contributes to the Washington Post and other media outlets, and she lectures widely on topics related to women and gender. Critics have widely praised her latest book, Free Thinker, Sex, Suffrage, and the Extraordinary Life of Helen Hamilton Gardner. She is also a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians. Please welcome her. Hello, everyone. Danielle, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And thanks to Ned and everyone on the staff of the Minnesota Historical Society for welcoming me here tonight. And thanks to the Organization of American Historians for their Distinguished Lecture Bureau and for including me in it. And most of all, thanks to all of you for joining us uh, from near and far. That anyone is still going to a voluntary Zoom event um, is a miracle, a secular miracle, I think, at this point. So I'm really honored to spend the evening with you. And I look forward to your questions at the end and to discussing the Equal Rights Amendment with you um, shortly. I'm going to share my screen to show some images uh, for tonight's talk. So give me one second while I pull it up, please. So as Danielle mentioned, in 2020, as the nation marked the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, Virginia became the 38th and final state to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. And just a few weeks ago, in March, uh, March 17th, 2021, the House of Representatives voted 222 to 204 to remove the time clock on the ratification that technically expired in 1982. If the US Senate were to approve the companion bill co-sponsored by Senators Ben Cardin and Lisa Murkowski, the Equal Rights Amendment would become the 28th Amendment to the Constitution, nearly 100 years after it was first proposed in 1923. What might it mean if the ERA were finally adopted? Why is it so controversial among lawmakers when opinion polls repeatedly show that more than three fourths of Americans support it? And what does the history of the Equal Rights Amendment tell us about the status of women in American life throughout the 20th century and today? I want to suggest tonight that the question at the core of the Equal Rights Amendment debates then and now is, are women people? The unspoken corollary to that question is, or are women mothers? The success or failure of the ERA hinges on what equality means for women and whether or not women are considered as autonomous individuals as men are, 
or as actual slash potential mothers. And this is the conundrum, right? Cultural norms and policies surrounding sex, pregnancy, and motherhood create the conditions of female inequality. And yet, historically, the United States has resisted legislation that supports reproductive health care, pregnancy care, as well as aid for working mothers. So this creates a pickle. And this distinguishes the United States from all of our global peers in nearly all metrics related to maternal and infant health, along with pay equity and gender parity at all levels of the workforce. The ERA is one potential solution. The ERA was first proposed by suffrage leader Alice Paul in 1923. Paul was the founder and leader of the National Women's Party, and she led the charge for the federal amendment alongside her peers in the NWP and her rivals in the National American Women's Suffrage Association, which we can talk more about in the Q&A if you would like. That's a big part of my recent book. Paul considered the Equal Rights Amendment the logical next step to female equality following the successful ratification of the 19th Amendment. The ERA aimed to overturn many forms of sex discrimination that persisted after women attained the vote in 1920. Paul and her allies in the National Women's Party pointed out that over 1,000 state laws discriminated against women, including those barring women from jury service, <clears throat> those barring women from graduate school and countless professions and jobs, and the laws barring women from even controlling their own bank accounts. Rather than fight these laws individually one by one by one by one and state by state by state, Paul aimed for a federal strategy, much as she had done with the vote, where she encouraged suffrage leaders to stop fighting for the vote on a state by state basis and instead pursue a federal amendment. Paul hoped that a federal equal rights amendment would serve as a blanket amendment overturning these thousand various state discriminatory laws. The original text as written by Alice Paul herself from 1923 read simply, men and women shall have equal rights throughout the United States and every place subject to its jurisdiction. The goal of the Equal Rights Amendment was to erase sex as a basis of legal classification. But the vast majority of activist women, together with the vast majority of Americans, rejected this line of thinking. Opponents argued that women were different from men, and as such, women needed legal protections, not legal equality. Women's groups, labor unions, and others representing female factory workers had long pushed for protective legislation to spare women from the worst industrial ills of the era, such as unregulated job hours on the job, dangerous working conditions, and physical tasks too arduous for pregnant bodies. In the years leading up to the introduction of the Equal Rights Amendment, the Supreme Court endorsed workplace protections for women only in the landmark case Mueller v. Oregon from 1908. Kurt Mueller was a laundry owner from Portland, Oregon, and he was arrested for violating the state law that prohibited women from working more than 10 hours per day. Mueller appealed his conviction all the way to the Supreme Court, arguing, it is time we ceased to classify women in general with children, criminals, and idiots. Women are citizens, he argued, and their privileges and immunities may not thus be abridged by legislative majority. He and his allies were pushing for the courts to recognize women as independent bargainers for their jobs, which is how the courts considered men at this time. He was joined, uh, or he was opposed in this endeavor by Florence Kelly, the powerful leader of the National Consumers League. She disagreed with this line of thinking, and she enlisted future Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis to argue the case in front, uh, in favor of the Oregon 10-hour day in front of the Supreme Court. Florence Kelly had long been a leader in the consumer movement, the 
and also um, against child labor. So she was concerned about the rollback of protective legislation. In his brief before the Supreme Court, Judge Brandeis advanced the idea that special protective laws for women were necessary because facts of common knowledge establish that overwork is more disastrous to the health of women than of men, and because of women's special physical organization, he said. For women, overwork could impair childbirth and female functions. The Supreme Court agreed and unanimously upheld the Oregon 10-hour workday for women. The Supreme Court's decision in Mueller v. Oregon established that women were a special class of workers, not a gender neutral subject, as were men. Writing uh, for the court's unanimous decision, Justice David Brewer expounded on the political necessity of separate laws for women because he argued women has always been dependent upon men. <clears throat> and he goes on to argue, as you see here, that she would look to men for protection because her physical structure would impair proper discharge of her duties and especially of her maternal functions, having in view not merely her own health, but the well being of the race. These measures, he argued, justify legislation to protect her from the greed as well as the passion of man. In a separate section of this, Opinion Justice Brewer wrote that healthy mothers are essential for vigorous offspring. The physical well being of women becomes an object of public interest and care in order to preserve the strength of the race, he wrote. So Brewer's brief in this case set the legal precedent that women should be considered a class by herself. After the Mueller decision, affirmed sex as, quote, a valid basis for classification, the majority of states enacted protective labor legislation for women only. And despite the fact that many women did not have children, the courts considered all women as potential mothers. Throughout the 1920s, women debated what the ERA would mean for legal protections secured under Mueller v. Oregon. Opponents of the ERA, such as Alice Hamilton, who was a physician and an expert on occupational and industrial safety and the first woman to be appointed to the faculty at Harvard. Women like Alice Hamilton feared that the ERA would harm working class women by invalidating these hard won gender based workplace safety laws. On the other hand, Hall and her allies in the National Women's Party argued that the ERA would instead promote safe working conditions in the factories for all, men and women alike. But these debates divided and enervated the women's movement. By the end of the 1920s, not a single state had passed an equal rights provision and the women's movement had lost momentum and supporters. The Supreme Court ruling that women should be considered a class by herself remained unchallenged. The Women's Trade Union League were big um, opponents of the ERA in the 1920s and 1930s and helped make this case that women deserved and needed special protection under the law. They opposed the ERA because they had achieved so many victories, including an eight hour workday, a minimum wage, the abolition of child labor, and the establishment of some workplace safety laws. Now we reach the Great Depression and another chapter of debates about labor and the gender of labor and whose labor counts as actual work. Throughout the Great Depression and World War II, women entered the paid workforce in record numbers, but increasingly in sex segregated jobs, for example, as secretaries. Business and professional women's groups continued to endorse the ERA, but women in labor and politics remained opposed. In the 1930s, New Deal legislation extended some protections to all workers, regardless of gender, in large part thanks to the efforts of First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. But the majority of New Deal legislation enshrined the male laborer, the white male laborer in particular, as the one whose labor counts, 
for example, the Social Security Act of 1935 entitled men in fields not including agriculture or domestic service where people of color worked for unemployment insurance, whereas fields uh, dominated by women, such as the garment industry, were not eligible for these protections. You can see the sort of trademark glorification of male labor in this WPA mural from the Cincinnati Museum Center where I live and where I happened to visit earlier today. Thanks to the leadership of Eleanor Roosevelt though, some protections uh, that were gender neutral were passed during the Great Depression, including an eight hour workday and collective bargaining for men and women alike. Eleanor Roosevelt supported equal pay for women, but she also supported gender-based protective laws because she argued the state must concern itself with the health of women because the future of the race depends on women's ability to produce healthy offspring. Women are different from men, Roosevelt explained in her 1933 manifesto, it's up to the women. Women are equal in many ways, she wrote, but they cannot refuse to acknowledge their differences. In the 1940s, the Republican Party endorsed the ERA in its platform, and the Democratic Party followed suit in 1944. Alice Paul, pictured here, kept up the pressure, and she rewrote the text of the ERA in 1943, notably to remove the word women from it. The revised and current text reads, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Despite vocal opposition from women's groups, including the League of Women Voters, the American Association of University Women, and the Young Women's Christian Association, the ERA first came before the Senate for a vote in the summer of 1946. It may surprise you to know that the ERA passed that summer, 38 to 35, falling short of the necessary two-thirds congressional majority. Cheering the ERA's first defeat, the New York Times editorialized that motherhood cannot be amended, and we are glad the Senate didn't try. So again, we see here the central debate are women people or are women mothers? What happens when equality legislation pushes up against this idea that women are primarily mothers? In 1960, after newly elected President John F. Kennedy failed to appoint a single woman to his cabinet, longtime female activists in the Democratic Party demanded inclusion. Specifically, they proposed the creation of a commission on the status of women to be led by the former First Lady, Eleanor Roosevelt. Esther Peterson, head of the Labor Department of the Women's Bureau, supported both equal pay and protective labor legislation. And she hoped that this new commission would, quote, substitute constructive recommendations for the present troublesome and futile agitation about the Equal Rights Amendment. In October of 1963, the 24-member commission submitted its proposals to, quote, enable women to continue their roles as wives and mothers while making a maximum contribution to the world around them. In particular, this report recommended the removal of legal barriers to jury service, divorce and custody law reform, and federal support for daycare. The report rejected the Equal Rights Amendment on the grounds that women's equality was already guaranteed by the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. The press and the public, however, paid little attention to this commission or its findings. Nevertheless, by the end of 1963, Congress passed the first Equal Pay Act and provided some federal funds for daycare. By 1964, 32 states had formed their own commissions on women. And even though the Kennedy Commission denied the need for an ERA, by the mid-1960s, many labor groups and wage-earning women were coming to support it, which demonstrates a huge change from the 1920s and 1930s. As Eleanor Roosevelt explained, 
Many of us opposed the ERA because it would do away with protection in the labor field. But now with unionization, there is no reason why you shouldn't have it if you want it. In the 1960s, ending racial segregation and discrimination was a much more pressing national priority than promoting equal opportunity for women. But the two cases were and are fundamentally intertwined because of the ways in which race and gender intersect and because of the ways in which anti-discrimination laws are and have been written. For example, Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act was introduced to prohibit discrimination by race. At the last minute though, Representative Howard Smith of Virginia, a longtime supporter of the ERA and an ally of Alice Paul, who's still there leading the charge for the ERA 40 years later, he inserted the word sex into the amendment after being heavily lobbied to do so by Alice Paul and her allies. Smith's amendment inserting the word sex into the Civil Rights Act threw the fate of the overall act into question. Many people feared that this would be too radical of a change. After much wrangling and thanks to the bipartisan support of the very few women in Congress at that time, the Civil Rights Amendment did pass with the word sex included. So Title VII prohibits discrimination by race or by sex in employment law. In one of the many ironies of ERA history though, the Civil Rights Act, which was designed in some ways to obviate the need for an ERA, instead bolstered it. Female civic leaders, including some who had opposed the insertion of sex into Title VII, were dismayed to find that the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which had been created to enforce the Civil Rights Act, Title VII, they were surprised to find that the EEOC did not really investigate claims of sex discrimination, considering them sort of a joke and fo focusing all of the efforts on investigating claims of racial discrimination. So these women began to wonder, what is the point of having a law against sex discrimination if it was not enforced or upheld? Maybe women did need an equal rights amendment after all. So in 1966, a new civil rights organization for women was founded to address the inequalities highlighted by the uneven enforcement of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And this, as you well know, was the National Organization for Women, NOW. NOW revived the push for the ERA in 1967, and the amendment appealed to a new generation of women in ways that Alice Paul and her allies could never have imagined. The women of Alice Paul's generation believed that a woman should be able to choose a family or a career, a radical notion at the time. A priority of second wave feminists, however, was to dismantle the old idea that women's roles were inherently maternal and to suggest that a woman could have both a career and a family now rejected the notion that, quote, mothers have a special child care role that is not to be equally shared by fathers, and equal provided the buzzword for many of their goals of second wave feminism. Thus, the Equal Rights Amendment seemed a fitting, all-encompassing goal. With workplace pr protections secured by both legal precedent and strong labor unions, working class women now divided their support on equal rights. In many cases, it was union women who led the charge for equal pay and against workplace discrimination. They filed Title VII discrimination lawsuits and encouraged their unions to support the ERA. As one female member of the Chemical Workers Union explained at a congressional hearing, we do not want separate little unequal unfair laws and separate little unequal low paid jobs. Working class housewives, however, viewed the ERA as a threat to their status and as an assault against their values. These women were not angling to break into the all male fields they saw around them, such as coal miner, construction worker, or auto manufacturer. And they feared that stripping sex-based discriminations from the law 
would deprive them of spousal benefits such as alimony and social security provided to stay at home wives. The growing prominence of feminism in the early 1970s also helped elect a handful of women to Congress and to convince both political parties that federal laws needed to establish the equality of women. Representative Martha Griffiths, a former lawyer and judge from Michigan who had served in Congress since 1954, championed the ERA, reintroduced it, and steered it through Congress. The ERA passed the House for the first time uh, in 1970 and then again in 1971. Representative Shirley Chisholm, the first Black woman elected to Congress and the first African-American to run for president, delivered a historic and moving speech in support of the ERA on the House floor in 1970. Chisholm explained that she championed the ERA because it provides a logical basis for attack on the most subtle, most pervasive, and most institutionalized form of prejudice that exists. Discrimination against women, she thundered from the House floor solely on the basis of their sex, is so widespread that it seems to many persons normal, natural, and right. But the ERA stalled in the Senate as a result of attempts to add an amendment recusing women from the draft. Finally, on March 22nd, 1972, the Senate did pass the ERA by a whopping vote of 84 to eight. President Nixon signaled his support and by the end of the next year, 1973, 30 of the necessary 38 states had ratified the ERA. During the same time period, Representative Patsy Mink, the first woman of color ever elected to Congress, wrote and steered several other pieces of equity legislation into law, including Title IX and the Women's Educational Equity Act. But one piece of legislation that she helped write failed to become law, signaling the limits of the federal approach to women's equality. And that was the comprehensive Child Development Act of 1971. This bill would have created a national system of daycare centers to support low-income households. Both houses of Congress passed the bill, but President Nixon vetoed it. In fact, it's the only women's equality measure he did veto. Why? Well, he explained in his veto statement that he rejected the communal approach to child rearing and its family weakening implications. As the New York Times wrote about its defeat, the bill might have been fine for mother, but what about the child? Again, I ask you, are women people before the law or are women mothers? In the early 1970s, equality for women appeared inevitable and public opinion polls repeatedly showed strong support for a whole host of equity measures, including the ERA. Congress passed most of these laws, many of which were written by the female lawmakers we've just been talking about, guaranteeing equal access for female medical students, tax deductions for childcare expenses for working parents, extended pay equity, among many others. And the courts also displayed a novel enthusiasm for equality by rejecting single sex education, overturning workplace protections that applied only to women and upholding sex discrimination lawsuits. Popular culture too celebrated the equality of women in such iconic TV shows as the Mary Tyler Moore Show, which ran from 1970 to 1977. Mary Roberts, as of course you all know, uh, in Minneapolis, the single protagonist moved to Minneapolis after being dumped by her boyfriend and in the series finale, a still single Mary declared to her work friends that she had finally found her family. What is a family anyway, she asked. They're just people who make you feel less alone and really loved. And that's what you've done for me, she said. Thank you for being my family. But in 1977, the Mary Tyler Moore show went off the air and Indiana became the 35th and for many decades, final state to ratify the ERA. 
leaving the amendment just three states shy of adoption. What happened? Historians have identified multiple factors to explain the defeat of the ERA in the late 70s, from well-organized Mormon opposition to high-profile resistance from corporations such as Coors Brewing, feminist icon Gloria Steinem blamed the insurance lobby because removing sex-based actuarial tables might have cost the insurance industry millions of dollars and forced health insurers to fully cover women's reproductive health care. Steinem also pointed out that insurance agent was the most popular profession among male state legislators in the 1970s. In addition to the insurance lobby, Eleanor Smeal, president of the Fe Feminist Majority Foundation and past president of NOW, insisted that big business was to blame. Women are the cheap labor pool, she explained. If an ERA were to be ratified, corporations would not only have to pay women more, they might also be subject to settlements for past wage and promotion discrimination. All of these factors no doubt played a role, played a role in the failure of the ERA, but most people, historians and activists alike, agree that credit or blame, depending on who you ask, belongs to the savvy political activist disguised as a housewife named Phyllis Schlafly. In the mid 1970s, Phyllis Schlafly rose to national prominence and ignited a national movement by arguing that women were fundamentally different from men. Rather than wanting equality with men, Schlafly argued that what women wanted was the right to stay home and be homemakers. Shafley and her allies redefined women's equality as fundamentally opposed to what she termed family values, and she founded an organization to fight the ERA. It was called Stop ERA, which stood for Stop Taking Our Privileges. Together, Shafley and her allies brought the ERA to a grinding halt. We might also talk about the depiction of Shafley in the recent television series, Mrs. America. Between 1973 and her death in 2016, Phyllis Schlafly tirelessly toured the country, goaded feminists, and appeared on countless TV show and radio programs to derail the Equal Rights Amendment. Even though she was a lawyer and seasoned political activist, Shafley relished by beginning, beginning her speeches by saying, I'd like to thank my husband, Frank, for letting me be here. She knew this drove the libbers, as she called them, crazy. Shafley argued that the ERA would lead to women being drafted, same-sex marriage, and gender-neutral bathrooms. These fear-based tactics made for catchy buttons and posters, but the crux of her message was that the ERA would prohibit women from being housewives and that women were fundamentally different from men. As Shafley explained, women want and need protection. Any male who is a man or a gentleman will accept the responsibility of protecting women. Shafley's most effective strategy was to harness the various strains of ERA opposition including conservative backlash against the Supreme Court's decision in 1973 in Roe v. Wade into one coherent narrative. And her narrative went something like this. God and nature intended for women first and foremost to be mothers. Threats to this natural order were to be opposed. Over the past 45 years, Many of the anxieties expressed by Shafley's Stop ERA campaign have come to pass anyway. On June 26, 2015, the Supreme Court ruled that same-sex marriages are legal in all 50 states. And in December 2015, the Pentagon announced that women could now serve on the front lines of combat, even though women are still not a subject to the draft. And despite vocal opposition in states such as North Carolina, gender neutral bathrooms are becoming the norm in schools, workplaces, and public buildings. At the same time, 
With middle-class wages stagnant and with marriage rates declining, Shafley's homemaker ideal is increasingly rare. Indeed, the U.S. Census Bureau titled a recent report, The Single Life, and noted that a record 53% of women 18 and older are single, along with 47% of men. None of these legal, political, and cultural shifts, however, have directly challenged the widespread conviction that women's primary role is maternal, or put another way, that domestic tasks are best completed by women. Following the 2016 election of President Donald Trump and the growth of the Me Too movement, activists revivified the push for the ERA. In 2017, Nevada became the 36th state to ratify, then Illinois, and last year, Virginia became the, 20, the, the 38th. But the, put, but the path to adoption remains complicated by legal obstacles and lingering cultural objections, again, mainly dealing with questions of motherhood and or female sexuality. The overwhelming majority of Americans continue to profess support for women's equality and especially for equal pay, but we remain ambivalent about proposals that would turn the abstract principle of equality into concrete policies. Since the late 1970s, Americans have come to a tentative and tacit compromise with regard to women's equality. Women can now enter any field, though some are notoriously more resistant to women than others, and work as hard as they are able as long as we also still take care of the children and the home. This ideology was impressed upon the nation uh, most memorably in the classic 1978 Anjali ad campaign, which many of you may remember. Uh, the catchy song about bringing home the bacon and frying it up in a pan and never letting your man forget that he's a man because you're a woman. The tagline for this Anjali uh, Camp ad campaign was the eight hour perfume for the 24 hour woman. Social scientists refer to this 24 hour woman as the second shift phenomenon. Since the 70s and 80s, countless studies have documented the pervasiveness of the so called second shift across age, race, ethnic, regional, and class distinctions. After women work a full day at their jobs, they come home for a second shift of domestic labor, and for many, another late night round of work after the children go to bed. A recent study indicates that the gender pay gap is largely the result of motherhood. These existing inequalities have been put in bold relief by the global pandemic and resulting mass exodus of women from paid labor a trend that economists are now referring to as a she, session, a she session. 2020 marked the first time since 1948 that women's unemployment reached double digit numbers. This is in part because female dominated industries such as retail service and hospitality have been hardest hit by the pandemic and because women are much more likely than men to leave the paid labor force to take care of sick loved ones or children who are home from school. As Congress and state legislatures now debate both the ERA and various pandemic relief measures, how we define women's equality is once again front page news. There are two main strategies for the adoption of the ERA. One is to work with the existing 38 state ratifications and press Congress to discount the time clock provisions. The other, favored by Ruth Bader Ginsburg and others, would be to start from scratch. Some opponents of the ERA argue that we no longer need it because women are protected under the 14th Amendment and the long precedent of case law pioneered by the late Polly Murray and the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg that dismantled the legality of sex discrimination. ERA proponents, on the other hand, contend that while many of the de jure aspects of sex discrimination are now illegal, we are still a long way from gender equality, 
The ERA would enable lawmakers to pass much more sweeping gender equity measures, especially in terms of curbing sexual harassment, sexual assault, and domestic violence. The ERA would also potentially expand health care for women and promote pay equity, along with support for child care. For nearly 100 years, the major sticking point in debates about the ERA has been whether or not women should be classified as autonomous people or as mothers. The courts, the Congress, and to some extent, the American people have essentially decided that women are not people deserving of equal rights. Women are mothers deserving of special rights. As Becky Harris, the lone female Nevada state senator who voted against ratification in the state in 2017, as she explained, an equal rights amendment without exclusions to protect families and protect children is something I cannot support. Are women people? Maybe. But mothers, variously depicted as a cross between superhero and maidservant, are not. So the questions I would like for you to consider tonight are, how should we view women under the law as gender neutral persons or as mothers? What would America look like if women and men alike were considered equally valuable as parents? And what if we considered the disparate impact of existing laws on women? How might we, revis how might we revisit and rewrite these laws more equitably? I thank you so much for your time and, and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you so much, Professor Hamlin. That was fascinating. Um, we do have some questions uh, to start. So I hope everybody else will uh, keep thinking as they hear these questions. These were submitted anonymously. So the first question I believe is referring to uh, Phyllis Schlafly's the efforts that she led which is, did the fear-based tactics have any religious influence to them? It seems that would gain more traction or is it just the culture at the time? Could you repeat that again? Did, did Phyllis sure. So did have um, Phyllis Schlafly's efforts or her tactics using fear, was there a religious element um, or was it the culture at the time? Oh yes, no, she was deeply grounded in religious um, arguments. And she, um, you know, a lot of historians of politics cite Shafley as really the architect of the realignment of the Republican Party in the 70s and 80s around religious conservatives and family values. So she brings to the Republican Party conservative religious homemakers and especially white women from the South and rural areas. So she very much is making a religious argument. So one of her, you know, kind of more famous um, slogans against the ERA was that the Garden of Eden, you know, is Adam and Eve, not Steve, right? So she's making sort of these biblically based objections um, that are grounded in her view of religion um, and her take on Catholicism. All right. Second question. In comparison to other developed countries, is the U.S. more behind, ahead, or on the same page in terms of gender equity? The U.S. is very much behind in so many measures. Um, and the one I want to highlight here is maternal health. So especially for women of color. And this is one of those kind of great ironies or some would maybe say hypocrisies of much American law, right? If we say we are we value motherhood, we value children, but yet we have the highest rates of maternal and infant mortality, especially for women of color, women of color in the you know westernized world. So that's one area in which we fall very behind. Uh, pater maternity leave uh, is also another area where we really stand out among our peers. Um, and another is gender parity in terms of positions of leadership in government and in terms of equal pay. So in all of these equity measures, the United States falls far behind. And on a related note, um, I think the ERA coalition has found that 22 other countries have some version of an ERA, you know, some statement in their constitution yeah. during the equality of women and in, in, in not having such a statement, our peers include Saudi Arabia. Um, so we are very much not in the norm um, in terms of not having a constitutional provision regarding gender equity. Yeah. 
So this is a question that's going to call upon you to be a political consultant. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, Suzanne wants to know, ERA is still needed, but current U.S. Senate Republicans do not support passage. The Republican Party has split from supporting ERA to opposing it. How can we get the Senate to support the change in the timeline? Um, okay, well, here I'm going to quote Carrie Chapman Catt, the president of NASA, who, when faced with a similar issue in 1918, um, after the 19th Amendment had passed the House, but was uh, stubbornly two votes shy in the Senate, she declared that if the members of the Senate cannot change their mind, the members of the Senate must be changed. So I would say... <laughs> What we need to do for the ERA and for so many other pressing issues facing our society is to fight tooth and nail against these restrictive voting rights laws that are now being put in place in so many states and instead support comprehensive voting rights access. Uh, so that's something that was really a standout issue for me in 2020 as I was giving so many talks about the 19th Amendment, right? The takeaway message there is we have no constitutional right to vote. We have many um, provisions that say you can't discriminate based on race, you can't discriminate based on sex, but we do not have a law that says citizenship equals voting rights. And that is what we need, comprehensive voting rights reform. Thank you. Um, Kimberly is asking about something you mentioned toward the end, uh, the idea of uh, that the late uh, Justice Ginsburg had starting from scratch, what would that entail? And do you think it makes sense? I mean, far be it for me to um, disagree with RBG about anything. However, um, I do agree. So there's a, a wonderful new book out by um, Julie Suk, S-U-K, about um, the Equal Rights Amendment. So in this book, she makes the case, she's a, um, uh, a professor of law at Yale, and she makes the case really that the best way to go is what's called the three-state strategy, which would be to press forward with the current 38 states and, um, and press for ratification that way. And so I'm convinced by that argument. And in fact, just the late Justice Ginsburg also argued that the time clock may not really be constitutional or able to be upheld because it's in the preamble to the ERA, not in the ERA itself. So I, I think um, a, a better way to go would be to push forward with the existing 38 ratifications. Okay, um, Christina asked, do you think we should rewrite ERA? I mean, that's, I think that's a similar question to the one we just had. Okay, that's what I was thinking. Uh, yes, yeah. I would say, I mean, I would say we, have, we are so close. We have not been this close, you know, since 1973. Um, so we have not been this close in my lifetime. So I would say we should uh, press forward with the existing 38 ratifications. Um, Kimberly wants to know, can you say more about the time block? time clock in the preamble. I'm not sure what that means. So um, in the, the, there's a question among uh, lawyers and legal historians, of which I am not. Um, so there's a question about what, to what extent can the, can, con can the, can constitutional amendments be bound by these time clock provisions? So uh -huh. To the ERA, it says that it has to be ratified within seven years. So at first, it had to be ratified by seventy nine because it was passed in seventy two. Then they then Congress passed a law extending it to eighty two, saying it could have until eighty two ratified. But the question is, not all amendments have these time clocks, and does it really matter if they do have time clocks? And if Congress is the one who controls how amendments come to be, can't Congress just simply say the time, if the Congress can say the time clock counts, can't Congress also say the time clock doesn't count? So there is some precedent for time clocks not counting and for amendments being in the works for many, many years, right? Um, the other issue at play is that five states um, that ratified in the 70s subsequently tried to rescind their ratifications. So that's another legal, political 
challenge slash obstacle, but that one seems easier because there is a stronger precedent in that several states also tried to rescind their ratification of the 14th Amendment in the 19th century, which was a provision to re-enter the Union after the Civil War. But in that case, um, it was ruled that, no, once you have ratified, you have ratified, you cannot take it back. So uh, that does not seem to be as big of an issue as this time clock issue. But I do think there is a strong enough um, case to be made, and various people have, including Ruth Bader Ginsburg, have made it, that the time clock is sort of arbitrary and that Congress yeah. could, you know, overturn it pretty easily if it wanted to. And that's yeah. what the House has now done twice. It does sound self-created. Uh, Lisa's wondering, in the conversations you've been part of, um, you know, doing this history, has there been any, uh, have you heard any talk about which of the three states would be the likeliest to shift out of the well, we have all the we have all the 38 now so right. is that so all the i think they're maybe confused maybe they're asking about the oh, three state solution why it's called three state strategy yeah i think that's an i i'm i was confused by that too i think that's an older term that era proponents were debating before the three states <laughs> did ratify uh, that's my understanding. So I, I think it just means that we do we count the post 2017 ratifications of Nevada, Illinois, Got Virginia? It. Do we count? Can we count those three or not? Can we count the three since 82 when the time clock technically it's expired? So um, Suzanne says there are so many women, people in, who do not know that ERA never passed. Most people think that it was done years ago. <laughs> How can we get Pat, get this issue more out in the public? And I, I do, that's an interesting question because it does feel like it's it's a it's a much more covert. I remember the fight in the yeah, 70s, yeah. even though I was a little kid, I saw it on the news and, and it just, I don't know if that's partly because of the 2016 in Virginia and we, then we, you know, we were thinking about other things. I don't know. What do you think? Yes, I think in part, um, we forgot about the ERA for many years because in some ways, Phyllis Schlafly really won the debate. Um, and you know, um, the 1980s was, and now here I always think of that classic book by Susan Faludi called Backlash. Mm. Writes about how the you know mainstream culture, political culture of the 80s really witnessed a backlash against so many reforms of the 70s and turned feminism into the other F word, right? Um, so people were thinking that this is not you know a, a discussion we want to be having and sort of buried this rich history of the you know unicorn era when Republican presidents signed the ERA into law and when Mary Tyler Moore was the number one show on TV, right? We forgot that this uh, was a recent time period in our history. So to revive this history, I think it's so important to do programs like uh, the one that Danielle and the Minnesota Historical Society has organized for us tonight. And it's so important to tell these stories um, in our newspapers, in our textbooks, in our books that we read and write, in our popular culture, right? So even though I sort of have mixed feelings about Mrs. America, the TV show um, that sort of features Phyllis Schlafly, it makes her seem like she was like a super nice person, which she really was not. Um, <laughs> so I think that's one way to kind of keep the conversation going and to introduce new generations, younger generations of people to these longstanding debates about equality in, for women. It was fascinated throughout your talk, uh, but the, the thread of class yes, that woven into, and, and so what, how do I entangle that? How do we understand, like, when did, because oftentimes, you know, I think that the fight for ERA is like, um, like the second wave feminist movement is often characterized as, as being primarily about and for white middle-class women. And that's so how 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 is, how is that much playing of its out? History. How, yeah, how how is that played out over time? So yeah, so it, for much of its history, that's what it was. So it was perceived kind of rightly as a fight um, led by and for middle class and upper class white women. That's kind of what Alice Paul intended, right? She was not so much thinking about working class women in the factory. She was thinking about women who might want to be partners in the law firm, right? <laughs> she was thinking about those sorts of issues. Um, 
But and that's why labor union leaders like Florence Kelly, like women's trade union lead, like Alice Hamilton opposed it, right? Because they feared that working class women, instead of being helped by the ERA, would be harmed. But as labor unions drew strength in the decades following the Great Depression, and as Congress passed much more comprehensive gender neutral labor reforms, this was not so much of an issue, right? Because all workers received better protections. All workers were guaranteed an eight hour day. Mm -hmm. Having the discussion so much about male versus female laborers. Then the issue became equal pay for equal work. Now women laborers are the ones leading the charge for the ERA in many cases in the 60s and 70s. They are the ones getting their union bosses to support it because it wasn't so much about protecting their specialness and their delicate physiques, right? It was about equal pay for equal work. So there we really see female laborers leading the charge, but where the class issue there becomes uh, working class housewives are less likely to support the ERA. Right. The more dependent on alimony and social security uh, provisions for wives. So that's one sort of lingering class-based rift, but the one among working women recedes in the 60s and 70s and working women become champions for the ERA as do women of color, right? So I tried to also highlight that in, in my slides at Images tonight, right? That it's women of color, Shirley Chisholm, Patsy Mink, who are leading the charge, not just for the ERA, but a whole host of equity legislation mm. um, 70s through today. Were there any, in, in the history, in the long history of this amendment, were there ever, ever, ever any efforts to uncouple women's equality from motherhood? given the nature of access to birth control and, and all of the other structures that would allow that to be functional for, for a lot of women? I mean, I think that's kind of what the ERA is trying to do, right? To say okay. <laughs> that parent, like laws should benefit parents. Just like, you know, Alice Paul previously argued, labor laws should benefit workers. Our laws should benefit parents, right? Not mothers. Um, and that I think is one um, of people who are really pushing the charge for the ERA now, that's one of their most compelling arguments, right? right? Um, so yes, I think that's what the ERA pro proposes to do now. Um, another thing that I often think about and I wrote about in the longer version of this talk in an essay is, um, is the role of marriage in these debates and the mm. way in which same-sex marriage. Um, so again, that was one of the sort of, you know, scare tactics used by Phyllis Schlafly was gender neutral bathrooms, women in the military, same-sex marriage. And all of these things have come to pass, yeah, right, without the ERA. Um, and and in, in same-sex marriage, I think, provides a way forward towards equality in that so many, um, so many, barriers to women's equality are domestic, right? The second shift, that's the our, that's a root cause of the pay gap, that's a root cause of the glass ceiling because women are too busy taking care of their homes to really excel in all these ways or to be equal in the workforce. But in same-sex marriages, that goes away, right? Who's the wife? <laughs> same-sex marriages are founded right. on equality, right? Where both spouses do their share. So, and they also, you know, study after study shows are happier. <laughs> These more egalitarian marriages are much happier um, than heterosexual marriages by and large, in which even among the most, you know, forward thinking husbands, there is this underlying issue that really it's the wife's job. And, and we see this, you know, in bold during the pandemic, right? So mm. many women have left the workforce because, oh, mm. it just makes more sense for me. It doesn't make as much sense for Bob to leave his job. So I'll stay home with the kids. Now, some cases it is a choice. In some cases, it's not a choice, right? Like if you have no childcare and if your kids are home for a year, well, you are staying home. <laughs> so, and this disproportionately impacts women. And so anyway, I think the extent to which we can work out the issue of the second shift with or without the ERA would do wonders um, for women's equality overall. Becky wants to know how does the ERA or how might ERA benefit transgender women? So I think that's another really interesting aspect of these discussions. Um, and 
the ERA says is you can't discriminate based on sex, right? So I think it would in fact expand, or at least I hope it would expand protections regardless of gender or sex or where one falls on the spectrum, right? Sort of along the lines of some of the executive orders that President Biden signed immediately upon coming into office. Um, and now that the uh, recent book by Professor Suk, S-U-K, um, about the ERA, she has a, this, a really great um, interview in Ms. Magazine where she talks about some of these and she talks about the importance of having a really robust legislative debate about the ERA to help the courts interpret what the ERA might mean. So if you have just like, a, if the ERA just were to pass magically in the courts and we didn't have a lot of precedent to draw from in terms of intentions, that would maybe lead to a weaker interpretation, whereas mm -hmm. what we would want was a more robust um, interpretation. So that's one way to think about it as well. Okay, and the last question comes from Jane. Um, and I hope the thunderstorm that's just broken out outside my house isn't coming through on my, on my microphone. Um, how would you reconcile, or at least how do you think about the Me Too movement and ERA in connection with one another? How do you see that, their relationship? That's a great question. Um, so I think a lot about the Me Too movement. Um, I designed and taught a class in the fall, I think it's the first um, in our country about the history of Me Too, called Me Too, A Cultural History, uh, from Pocahontas to the, so this is something I think a lot about. And um, I think the ERA, and, and again, this is not just me, this is a, a lot of proponents of the ERA have argued that um, one of the things not covered by the 14th Amendment and not covered by the vast history of um, legal precedent set by Ruth Bader Ginsburg that outlaws sex discrimination. One thing not really covered by that is a robust response to violence against women, sexual harassment, and sexual assault. And there we could see a much more expansive interpretation, much more expansive laws um, if Congress, if the ERA were to be ratified. So I think there could be, that could be one positive uh, ramification. That's a very hopeful note to, to end on. So I think we'll close there. Thank you okay. again, Professor Hamblin. And thanks Thank everyone so for, much. for coming out tonight. Thank you Bye -bye. so much, Danielle. And thanks everyone.